Today we're going to talk about having a laser focused and uh, focusing on what we are for, not what we're against. And I've been really thinking about this uh, quite a bit in, a, in, a, in different aspects. But then it was so funny, a couple of days in a row, I heard, the, I heard that same phrase used over and over by different people. We're focusing in on what we're for, not what we're against. And one way to focus in on what we're for is to understand what are we for. Uh, you know, as I was, I was thinking about it, you know, I love to... Uh, think about all kinds of things. I love to think. I love to kind of brainstorm. That's kind of my thing. I love to brainstorm. And I was brainstorming about it and I began to ask myself, okay, God, what am I for? And the first thing that popped up in my head was I'm for Jesus, right? I'm for my family. I love my family. Um, you know, I'm for life. I believe in life. Uh, I believe in eternal life. Uh, but then the silliness comes in. I believe in fun. I believe in joy. You know, I'm for happiness. I'm for uh, chocolate-covered almonds, dark chocolate only. I know that sounds strange, but when you think about it, we all have opinions. We all have preferences. And we all are for different things and against others. Like some people only like milk chocolate. Some people only like dark chocolate. You know, it's, it's what are they for? What's their opinion on it? What's their flavor? What do they like? But the one thing that we have to remember is when we're talking about what we're for, we have to understand what the truth is and not just our truth, but the truth of the word. Because I know all of us have gone through different seasons of understanding what the word says. You know, things that we understood when we first became saved, we've had a greater revelation of as we've grown. Or even things that we were taught that were an opinion or a perspective that weren't necessarily biblical, we've been able to sharpen from that. Um, you know, it's even, I was thinking about even the the traditions of our house and what we do is our perspective, our truth. Where if you take someone else that was brought up in a different environment, a different thought process, their traditions and their perspective and their truth is going to be different. Right. But as a body of Christ, we all have to get on the same page of what the truth is. And the truth is according to what the word says. And we do get, gain greater understanding as we go. You know, when we become saved, we don't have a download of every understanding from heaven possible. It's a growing process. It's, it's, it's a sharpening process. It's a, it's a searching process. There, I didn't think I was going to get that to work. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to go to Luke 9, and we're just going to kind of go through Luke 9. Because I gotta get rid of this man. Excuse me. That's what husbands are for. I can't talk and eat a mint at the same time. Apparently, that level of coordination has escaped me. But you know, we're gonna talk about what does the word say and how does God want to sharpen our understanding? How does He want to? Are there things within what we believe? that uh, doesn't include the fullness of what he wants us to believe? Are there things in what we believe that we've forgotten a little portion of it? Or are there things in what we believe that God wants us to be assured of, to be confirmed in? And we know that the way that we grow is by reading the word, being with other people to discern the word, to listen to the word, and... Um, just listening to the presence of God. So we're going to start on uh, Luke 9. We're going to start with just verse 1. And as we go through it, we're just going to pray that God is going to open up our hearts to little nuggets that he wants to deposit in us, little nuggets of truth. So, Father, we just thank you that your word is alive. Yeah. And when we read the word, it is alive. Yeah. It's not just ink on paper. It is living. It has breath in it. 
It has the ability to transform us. It has ability to shift our mind in an instant. It has the ability to feed us and give us the nurturing and the nutrition that we need. Your word has the ability to illuminate things in us that we never thought possible. We never even understood. But it's because your word is living. It is breathing. It is uh, tangible. It is, it, you've given us the ability to consume the word and let it permeate who we are. So God, as we read your word this morning, let life be uh, breathed into us. Let, let truth become part of our very core, the cellular nature of who we are. That when we leave, we, we leave with a, a breath of truth blown into us, Lord. And even as I was praying that, I'm thinking about that Ezekiel 37. You know, you're, Ezekiel's saying, God, you know, when you ask him, do those, can those bones live? And those bones live out of the breath of you that's being blown into them. That's who we are. We live out of your breath, your very being, Jesus. So we thank you, Holy Spirit. Just teach us as we read through your word today. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Luke 9, 1, it says, Now Jesus called together the 12 disciples and gave them the right to exercise power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. Then he sent them out on a brief journey to preach the kingdom of God and to perform healing. So the, G so the disciples have been with Jesus for about a year and a half, maybe two years. I was looking at the date, the timeline on that. And they have been given everything they need to do what they were called to do. Not only were they given the authority of Christ... And it wasn't just a delegated authority. We don't have just the delegated authority. You know, how I can, I can look at Caitlin and say, Caitlin, you know, I give you authority to lead the worship. To re, you know, that's a delegated authority. But Jesus gives us the authority. He endues us with his presence. So he gives us the same authority that he carries. And when we have that authority, with it comes his... his our ability to release his power. So our authority and our ability to release his power is so we can go out and have authority over all the demons. We can heal diseases and we can preach the kingdom of God and perform healing. Now, when we we're beginning on this, I want y'all to think about, is that the truth that exists within me? Now, is it an intellectual truth? Because we've read the word and we understand what it says. Or is it a internal truth? Because we have been endued with power by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. So all authority has been given to us so that we can exercise power over anything that does not align with the kingdom of God. Sickness, demons, disease. And we have the power to release the kingdom by preaching the gospel. And you may think, well, I'm not a preacher. Sure you are. You preach every day according to what you do. We understand that so much, uh, the way we are perceived, most of the time comes out, comes out of how we act, not what we say. Because when people see us walk in holiness, people see us walk in puriness, people see us walk in kindness, that is our, that is our thought process. You know, when we speak, we speak whatever's good and whatever's kind and whatever's uh, trustworthy, that's what we speak then people see the kingdom of God being released in us, in our businesses, you know, with our integrity and the way we treat our customers, our clients. So people see the kingdom of God being preached from us 
by our actions and by our words. And the authority to be able to carry the power and the presence of God is already in us. If you are a believer in Christ, that is in you. So we have the ability to, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, to cleanse the leopards, to preach the gospel of Christ. That's, that's the power and the authority that we carry in us. So does our plumb line align with that truth? And then even as we go through these things, some of it's just these things that we really ponder because we know that that's true, but then, then sometimes we compare it to what we see with our eyes as opposed to what we know with our spirit. And we'll come across one of these as we read through uh, Luke 9. But what we have to understand is, and I, it's all of us, I think it's such a transforming process of us that our minds do not dictate what we believe. It is the Spirit of God leading our spirit that gives us understanding to what we are to believe. Not our intellect. Our intellect helps us process it. But it is the Spirit of God that gives us the revelation of the truth. And that is what the Word says. The Word says the Spirit of God will teach us. It will unfold things of God to us. The Spirit of God is the one who keeps us on that track of, of what is truth. And part of the process we go through when we become believers is detoxing from the things that are not true that don't line up with Scripture. We all have to detox. We all have to get rid of those things that aren't the truth so that we can live out of the pureness, the holiness that God has called us to be. Okay? Let's go. Verse uh, 3. He said to them, take nothing for your journey that might encumber you, neither a walking stick, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that city to go to, the another, to, go to another. And as for all those who do not welcome you, when you leave that city, shake the dust off your feet, breaking all the ties with them as a testimony against them that they have rejected my message. So they began going from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing the sick everywhere. Now, what does that mean to us? As Christ sends us out, as we are sent out on our journey every single morning when we wake up, we're on a journey. We're on a journey of going in and, and seeing what God has for us. And it's interesting because here he tells them, don't take anything. Because I want you to understand what it is to live under my provision. Where you go, the people that will accept you will take care of you. The people who don't. You don't stay there. You move on. So he sent them out with total dependence on what he said to them early, earlier. Everything you need, I've given to you. So don't take anything with you because everything you need. Of course, in the natural mind, we're thinking, you know, I might need my stuff, right? I might need my stuff. I might need some comforts of home, like maybe an extra tunic just in case. Or, or, you know, when we think about that type of thought process, it's hard. But how many of you have had God send you out somewhere that didn't make sense and he wanted you to go minimal and he took care of everything you need? Has anybody had that? I figure there's, there's probably more than, than one. But sometimes it's hard to even, even correlate what this is saying to our everyday life. 
You know, we get this, this image of the disciples heading out, taking nothing. And we, we, it's hard for us to relate to when God called us to step out, when we didn't feel like we had what we needed and he provided everything we needed. And when we do it in that equation, it's easier to say, oh, yes, I remember when. You know, I remember when we did this or when we did that. God wants us to understand this provision journey he has for us. And even if we go without anything, he's given us everything. And it may not be tangible in my purse, you know, in my pocket. But when we get to where we need something, there's a supply in some form by him. Whether it's supernatural or natural. Okay, let's keep going. Luke 9, uh, we're going we're to skip over a few verses and start in verse 10. When the apostles returned, they told him all that they had done. He took them with him and he privately withdrew. But when the crowds learned of it, they followed him and he welcomed them. And he began talking to them about the kingdom of God and healing those who needed to be healed. Now the day was ending and the 12 disciples came and said to him, send the crowd away so that they may go into the surrounding village and countryside and find lodging and get provisions because here we are in an isolated place. He said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50. They did so. And had them all sit down. They did so and had them all sit down. He took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up to heaven and gave thanks. He blessed them and he broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. They all ate and were completely satisfied and the broken pieces which they had left were abundant, uh, left over were abundant and were picked up, 12 baskets full. So now think about this. You know, we've heard this story. The story is not a new story. We, we talk about the story when we talk about supernatural, when we talk about provision, when we talk about multiplication. But just think about this in the terms of our own lives. There are seasons in our life where we need the multiplication of God supernaturally to be able to provide the next step, to provide for our families, to provide for our businesses, you know, to be able to move forward. And it's funny because Jesus tells them, you have it. You have exactly what you need. And it is that bridge between knowing that's Christ in us, knowing that we have all authority, knowing that we have all power, knowing that we have the ability to multiply, to, to do the same thing that Jesus did. And knowing that we have testimonies of that, that we just have to resurrect within us in order to build our faith, to step into where God wants us to be. You know, there's, I know that there's been many times for us where, um, and I know I've shared this a little bit a while back, when we had a business that it just, the economy had hit and it was just not working. But God took care of our payroll supernaturally. God took care of us being able to pay our bills through multiplication of what we had and hard work. And if we would have sat down and said, okay, God, this is what you need to do in order for us to be able to do what we needed to do, we would have gotten far less than what we got. It's that knowing that that provision is for us in the way that God has planned for us. And, you know, when you think about all 5,000 people, I've never had to look at 5,000 people with... Uh, a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish and say, okay, let's feed everybody. 
But God wants us to understand the magnitude of our ability to partner with him for a greater provision. It's the magnitude of it. Where for this, this is hard for us to relate to our day to day. Because most of us don't have 5,000 people we're trying to feed. I know Deborah has, uh, uh, you know, probably, <laughs> she, pay, she feeds about 500 a day, right? Yeah, about 500 a day. But, you know, most of us in, in, the, in the smallness of our realm, that's not what we have. But in the greatness of the kingdom, that's what we have access to. And in this supernatural vision, not only did they get fed, but there was more than enough. Not everybody got a little tiny bite. They had more than enough. They were satisfied. They were full. And that's where we have to understand what is our truth in these in these principles that God is teaching you know it's, a, it's funny if you go through the gospels if you go through them chronologically you'll see, you'll see the the different stories told by Luke by Matthew by Mark by John different you know but they're all told from a different perspective but you will also see that Jesus is teaching them the same thing over and over and over again, it's just in different perspectives. You know, first they fed the 4,000, 5,000, then they fed the 4,000. You know, um, first he sends out the 10, and later on he's going to, I mean the 12, but later on he's going to send out the 70. You know, it's the same thing that, that's modeled over and over again. So when we read the scriptures over and over again, what happens is it begins to um, reconfirm what we already know in us. It will, you'll think, I've already read this story, you know, but Matthew has a, John has a version, Luke has a version. But if you continue to read them over and over again, there is a life that is transformed. You know, it's, it's like taking the truth and letting it flush out those little ebbs of unbelief or those little areas where you're like, I'm not sure that that would work for me. I'm not sure that God will do it for them because there's a greater purpose. Sometimes people read this, the scriptures and say, you know, it was for the bigger purpose. Well, it is for the bigger purpose, but it is for the understanding so we will know how to apply the principles of God, the power of God, the multiplication of God, the transformation of God to our own lives. They aren't these stories that aren't applicable. They aren't these stories that aren't transferable. Because what we see, what we hear, we can duplicate. I can tell there's some thought on this. Okay. Verse 18. Now it happened that Jesus was praying privately and the disciples went with him and asked, Who does the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, and some say Elisha, but others that one of the ancient prophets has come back to life. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? And, the, and Peter replied, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So who do you say he is? And, you know, it's just something that we have to continue to wrestle with. We may say, well, he is the Christ. He is the Savior. But God wants to unpack the different facets of what does that actually mean. What does that mean in our lives? When we say, Jesus, you are our Savior. You are, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. We read last week, you know, the wonder of, of, of Jesus, the, the expressed image of the living God. He wants us to engage in the unfolding of this revelation of who he is. He wants us to know him, not just as Savior, 
not just as the son of God. And I don't mean just in a, in a slight way, but you mean, but you know, not just as the big description. He wants us to understand him as the one who walks with us, the one who nudges us, the one who keeps us safe. I was reading, um, uh, I think it was Psalms 84 this morning, another Passion Translation, and it, it talks about how he is a, a, a um, like, a, it was like a, a wind of a shield wrapped around us, a protector around us the king of glory. You know, he wants us to understand what it's like to walk in an intimacy with him the way uh, John and Peter and James did, that, that trio that was so close to him that they saw things with Jesus that no one else saw. No one else got to see it. None of the other disciples got to see it. But he wants to show us what is possible with him in the relationship. And these aren't just things that happen, they are actually possibilities, invitations, if you will, for all of us to step into. I mean, what would it be like when you got to heaven and Jesus looked at you and said, you went for it all. You, you, were, you, were, you went after the closest you could get to me. That there were so many things that you were able to take in that no one else was interested in me. It's like having a friend. Do you want a friend that wants to know all about you, good, bad, and ugly? Or do you want a friend that just likes the surface sight? I only like you when your hair is done and you've got your jewelry on, you know? Or do you want someone who just goes after all of who you are? Jesus goes after us, after all of who we are, and he wants us to go after all of who he is. He wants those, those aspects of him to be what we hunger for. I hunger for that. Yeah. I hunger for that. I remember, uh, it's probably been, I don't know, 25 years ago or so, uh, maybe about 25, maybe 24. I don't know, something like that. It's been a while. But I remember I told Jesus, I said, I have got to have more. And if I can't have more, then I can't go on. Because I was trying to break out of who someone else told me Jesus was and trying to break into Jesus, who are you as my Savior? Who are you as, as my friend? Who are you as the blood of the Lamb? I was trying to figure out how do I break past all my preconceptions, all my teachings, all my this, that, and the other in order to break into a real, authentic, alive relationship with him. Uh, verse 21, he strictly warned and admonished them not to tell this to anyone, saying the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, uh, the Jewish high court, and be put to death and on the third day be raised up from death to life. And he was saying this to them. Oh, let me stop there. I want to talk about just 21, 22. So he told them not to... Uh, Tell anybody that he was the Messiah. But then he told them to go out and preach the gospel. But this revelation of the Messiah was something that the hearts were not prepared, the timing was not prepared for. But he said to them, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected as the Messiah. So he's telling them what is to come. And I just wanted to kind of throw this out to you just to pray on and to think about that, you know, when we have this revelation, Peter's had this revelation that he is the Christ, right? So then he tells them, out of your revelation, I share with you a secret. I share with you what's coming. I share with you what to look for. I'm giving you a heads up of what's coming. I mean, how many times has God given you a heads up 
out of that time of intimacy of what is coming. Though you may not understand it fully, they did not fully understand it. But he gives us a heads up out of that intimacy so that we're able to identify, to recognize when the shift of that prophetic encounter is going to happen. And that's what we want to do. We want to be able to live out of that intimacy, be able to steward the revelation of Christ that he wants to give us for this season, for the future. So that when that timing comes, we are prepared. We, we recognize that we're able to engage other people with what is coming. You know, you think about all the prophetic words you've heard for 2020. And really, if you did a, an analysis of them and put them all on a spreadsheet, I'm sure there's people that are that person, uh, you would be able to see themes within the prophetic words. You would be able to see pieces of the puzzle for what's coming in 2020 start being put together because God gives us all pieces and they all carry a familiar sound. So... When, you, when we're able to live out of that intimacy, having that revelation of who he is, he will open up the treasury of revelation and share it with you. He will share it with us because he's looking for people who can carry the future inside of them and bring that right timing, that right release of what he's shown us. Right? Okay. Verse 23. And, he's, and he's, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interest, and take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And following me, believing in me, conforming to me, um, to my example in living and, if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of the faith in me. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake, he is the one who will save it from the consequences of sin and separation. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, wealth, fame, success, and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed here and now of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when it comes in his glory, when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Heavenly Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there are some of you among those standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? What does it mean to deny ourselves? We all have different thoughts on it, different perspectives on it. But what does Jesus mean when he wants us to deny ourselves? I mean, there's a lot of thought on this. And there's a lot of scripture on this. What does real denial look like? But what he's asking us to do is to follow him. And in that following of him, we will see the things that don't line up with who he's called us to be, with the direction he's called us to be. I mean, think about when you first started to believe, for those who are believers, and where you are now. And how you follow Jesus and the transformation it's taken between when you began and where you are now. There's probably a lot of things that you might have entertained that you no longer entertained. There may be a mindset that you have that you didn't have back then. And, and that's probably a guarantee. You don't have the mindset of the kingdom when you're not part of the kingdom people. You might be a good person, you might be a person of integrity, but the mindset of the kingdom comes when the mind of Christ becomes part of you. So we shift in what we are willing to enjoy, what we're willing to entertain, what we're willing to do. All that shifts as we shift 
and our obedience and our following of Christ. When we follow Christ, it's a whole different vision than when we're following, you know, the guy of Apple or the guy of, you know, Macintosh or some NFL player, whoever it is. But when we follow Christ, our vision becomes very narrow. Our capacity to sin becomes very limited. It doesn't mean we don't sin. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. But everything about us becomes aligned as we follow Christ. It has to. Because we can't follow Christ and kill our brother. We can't follow Christ and do all these external things that don't line up with Christ. Now you can say, well, I have done these things. We all, like I said, we've all sinned. But what happens is the more we follow, even just Luke 9, if we just take Luke 9, the more we follow the receiving our authority and the power, living out of that, the more we follow the fact that we've been given the power to preach the gospel and transform the world around us. The more we follow the understanding that everything we needed has been provided for in Christ. The more we stay in tune and aligned with that direction of where Christ has taken us. The more we are able to maintain a narrow focus. And it doesn't mean we're narrow in what we're doing. It just means that our eyes are set on Christ. And everything we do is to bring him honor, to bring him glory, to be transformed, to be more like him. That's what, that's what it means. And the more we do that, then the more we're unable to do other things because our focus, our actions, our directions are totally toward him. That's who we are. We are a focused people who love Jesus. That's who the body is. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, yeah, it says we pick up our cross and follow him. And I was thinking about Jesus hanging on the cross. And on one side of him was a man hanging on the cross. And then the other side of him, a man hanging on the cross. And Jesus took the path that would give us freedom, give us eternal life. But... One man beside him was repentant. He's like, can I, can I be with you? The other side was repulsed by who Jesus was. He didn't want any part of it. In fact, he mocked him too. And it's, it's interesting because it's like when he was talking about don't take anything with you. And if they welcome you, then spend time with them. But if they don't, move on from them. Jesus embraced the one who turned to him. Jesus can't force the one who repulsed by his presence to come to him. And that great gift from him for us to choose. Is a freedom that each one of us have. We can choose to be Jesus minded. Or we can choose not to be in everything that we do. And thinking about the two sinners on the, each side of Jesus. Each man on each side of Jesus. One chose to see who he was. And one chose to join the crowd to reject him. 
everyone has that freedom of choice. I'm just going to read John 3.16. You don't have to go there, Noah, but let me just read this. We all know the scripture, but I just wanted to read this in, in thought of that. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he gave his son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then on down it says, whoever believes and has decided to trust him is not judged. But the one who does not believe and rejects him as personal savior is already judged. Because he did not believe, because he has not believed and trusted in the name of the Lord, uh, of the only begotten son. You know, as we think about this what are we for? And being people of Christ, we've got to be for Jesus. We've got to be for what he has presented to us. And even though there are so many things we don't understand. I mean, you can read through the Bible and like, be like, I just don't get that. I'm not really sure what that means. And you can read every commentary. And honestly, I can tell you, there can be commentaries that completely are opposite of the other commentary. It just depends on who wrote it, you know, what their background is, what their core belief is. Um, you know, so you can read one and be like, oh, and you read the other one. It's like, oh, it's just the opposite of what that one says. So part of that believing is just pressing in to the fullness of the word. Being part of a body, a, a body that you can learn together and think through things together. And it doesn't mean you'll get an answer at the end of the day that you've got it all figured out. So here's the map for this one thing. But we know that there is one answer and the one answer is Jesus. We know that there is one way and the one way is Jesus. We know that there is one father, there is one son, and there is one Holy Spirit that are all God in one. I mean, there are things that are not unclear. It's just a matter of seeking the revelation for it. I mean, probably most of us, when we accepted Christ, we didn't say, you know, I fully understand how this all works, how you came down from heaven. I feel, fully understand how the blood covered it all. I fully understand that. What happened was his spirit grabbed a hold of our spirit and gave us the revelation that he is Savior, even though we may not have been able to have the full, you know, we couldn't have written a thesis on it, right? We couldn't have written a paper on it. We just knew that we had been transformed in some way. And living out of that transformation every single day in order to have this narrow vision of Christ alone. This narrow thought of if he takes a step, I'm taking a step. And you know, it's funny, we, uh, I mentioned our, um, what, are you, what did we do last week? The miracle service. And, you know, it's interesting because that is something that the Lord called us to do uh, with no real understanding of what it is. I mean, I know what a miracle is. And, um, but he said, I want you to do this. I want you to do this revival experiment. And every time you come, I want you to wait on me. Now, how many people are patient, amazing waiters? Don't lie to me. <laughs> because <laughs> I know I'm not. I am like, uh, let's get this party going. Let's go. That waiting alone is transforming. Because, uh, you know, he, he, it's very easy to put a service together. Okay, we're going to have worship a little. We're going to have a word. We're going to have, few, you know, it's very easy. But that waiting on God in those nights that we have this once a month is, is very different because every single one of them are different. Every single one of them, God shows up and does something that I had not planned for, that I, that I didn't have a heads up about. Um, 
I didn't get the revelation. I, you know, he just shows up. And part of that is a training, I know, for us to learn how to sense presence, movement, and whatever he did. And we don't even have the results of what he did. You know, somebody, we may see someone get healed in front of our eyes or, or um, this, like Chuck said this past week, we went silent for 15, over 15 minutes. Because the only reason I know is because I, I just happened to glance at my watch as they were winding down that one song and then it just stopped. And uh, how many are great at silence for 15 minutes? <laughs> for some of us, it wasn't long enough. For some of us, it was too long. For some of us, it was just right. But we trust for God, it was his perfection. And he did things that we don't know. We, he did things that we do know of. But it's that, you know, it's that. And, you know, I'm not saying that everybody needs to have a miracle service and wait and see. But it is that waiting on what is next, God. And, and moving in that direction with the uncertainty sometimes in our logical mind, but the certainty of his spirit in us. We step with risk in a lot of things that we do because we're not sure what it's going to look like on the other side, whether we're, you know, leaving our job or, or taking a leap of faith into something new. There is a risk involved that has an assurance inside, but a nervousness on the exterior. And it's that practice of that narrow view of just Jesus and allowing him to press us, to push us beyond where we are. And it's in every aspect of our life, but it starts in the intimacy of us and him. It starts in that intimacy where he can actually speak to us in whatever way he's going to speak to us, whether it's one word that stands out on the page, you know, my words, whatever it is. He will deposit something in us that will become the launching pad for us to go forward. And that's what we have to understand is this, this whole thing is this running with him, waiting on him, trusting him, but understanding that it's this process of learning and allowing us to go through the process of what am I for when it comes to you, Jesus? What am I for? What are the things that rub against me that I don't understand? For some people, healing rubs against them. They don't understand it and they don't feel like it should be a part of the Christian faith. They feel like there's no healing, there's nothing left for that. So that's a rub, you know, and, and God will keep rubbing us until he can work us into what would you like for me to believe Jesus? When I read this in your word about people being healed, what would you like for me to believe? And what is it in my mind that makes me against it when I see in your word that you are for it? And there's just two other places I want to read real quick. Um, there's actually a couple. We've got a few more minutes. Let me just go on. Uh, let's look at uh, Luke 9, 37. Let's start in verse 37. They've just gone through the transformation, transfiguration, where uh, they've had an encounter with Jesus, with Elijah, with Moses, with the Father. And... Um, I always find that, that very interesting. I, I love reading that. I'm going to start in verse 35 now that I've said that. At the end of the whole encounter, 
It says, then a voice came out of the clouds saying, this is my beloved son, my chosen one. Listen and obey and yield to him. That's the second time the father has spoken audibly about who his son was. One at the baptism of John, with John the Baptist and one here. And Peter, James, and John got to hear this. And it says, on the next day they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And a man from the crowd shouted for help. Teacher, I beg you to look at my son because he is my only child. And a spirit seized him and suddenly he cries out. And it throws him into convulsion so that he foams at the mouth and only with great difficulty does it leave, mauling and bruising him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here to me. Now, it's interesting. He's, he's, we'll, we'll talk about what he said, but it says, you know, it says, even while the boy was coming, the demon slammed him down on the down, threw him into a violent convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. They were all amazed, practically overwhelmed at the evidence of the greatness of God and his majesty and his wondrous works. And what's interesting about this is, is uh, in the New King James Version, it says faithless, which is unbelieving. But, it's, but it also means without trust in God. Now, was he saying that you don't trust me? It's interesting when you think about it because, or when you, you know, read on about it is he's saying that in this instance, there is unbelief there. In this instance, that word um, perverse. Okay. So that unbelieving and that perverse, when you, you've got unbelieving without trusting God, and the perverse means that it's distorted. It's opposite. It's a, it's, it's, it's a plot against the purposes and plans of God. That's what the interlinear says about the words. And when you think about putting those two together, it's without belief. It's without trust. It's, it's a distortion of what God's plan and purposes were for this boy. Now, what I want to say about this is we all struggle. We all have things that we struggle with. Part of the whole process of being a Christian, being a, a disciple, following Christ is that transforming work that happens, that occurs inside of us. That transformation occurs every day on a regular basis in our pursuit of God. Now, we understand if there's no pursuit of God, even though we believe in Jesus, there's not going to be transformation. Right? So that transforming work is ongoing. It is a process in us. The disciples, for whatever reason, they were unable to cast that demon out. Jesus says it was because they were unbelieving, unable to trust God in that, unable to transform their mind, their thoughts, their actions to align with the plans and purposes of God. Have you ever had that thing with God where you, you, you knew you were supposed to do something, but you just could not bring yourself to have the faith or the belief to actually get it done? 
and you learn from that and you move on. I can give you a zillion different examples, you know. And I have a, a thousand different questions too, you know, of, of how does this work in me, God? But, but God is, well, Jesus is showing the disciples. He rebukes this spirit and the spirit is gone. He's showing us the level of power and authority that we have over these things. Now, we also know that while we were in this process of uh, going through this, you know, obviously the disciples, they're in this process of, at some point, they were in this process of trying to get rid of this demon, right? Because if they hadn't tried it, then he wouldn't have said anything to them. If this, if this step wasn't ever taken, he wouldn't have saved them too. They have this demonic stronghold that is fighting against them, that is refusing to leave. In fact, I had someone share with me the other day that they'd gone somewhere and they um, smelled this really bad odor and they knew it was a demon. And they knew they needed to cast it out to command it to leave. But it was a battle, and they never could quite get that demonic uh, force to leave. And there's a whole reason behind all that. But uh, I just want to encourage us in this because when, when we have things that we have not had victory over, that we should have had victory over, God will bring us other opportunities. He will bring us revelation of why it didn't work. He will show us where maybe our mind needs to be tra uh, transformed into a, uh, a faith, a belief, a authority, um, you know, whatever that is. I don't know what that is. But as we risk and take steps and try things out, God is going to help us refine us, fine-tune us, direct us, organize us, push us, so we find that ability in him for that next thing. He didn't leave them behind and say, never mind. I've tried all I can try with you. I'm moving on. Get me another three. Get somebody else out here that maybe, no, he's just trying to get them to see the thing that, that was holding them back. He doesn't get tired of us or worn out by us. He just wants to have us to have his best and to get rid of anything that keeps us from receiving that best so we can release his best. And that's what I love about Jesus. He's just drawn us in for the more. He's drawn us in, you know, we, for the buffet, for all that there is. We can start in the appetizers and go all the way through the dessert. He's given us the more. Everything that he has, we can have. We're just learning how to use it. We're learning how to operate in it. We're learning how to move in it because he has it all for us. Nothing excluded, nothing held back. Nothing dangled but never given. He's given it all. And all of us have the freedom to have it all when we choose him. Amen? It's true. I love it. He wants to change our vision. So I just want to close with this, this one little um, section out of Acts 10.38. And I didn't give this to Noah, but I'm j I just want to read it. It says, Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with great power. Now, when it says that, as Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with great power, that's what he's given to us. We've been anointed by Christ through the Holy Spirit with great power to do the things that God has set forth for us to do. That should give us some boom. He did wonderful things for others and divinely healed all that were under the tyranny of the devil, for he, God had anointed him. We've all been anointed by Christ. We all carry the power of the Holy Spirit in us.
So part of our process as we go is letting God rewrite things within us that we haven't understood from what he's told us, from what we haven't received fully in what the word says. Just receiving all that he's given to us. Okay, let's, let's stand. I want to pray over us. God wants to change our vision to be able to see the way he sees. And in some things we can. And in some things he's still working on us. But it's that laser focus on God. What in your word? What in all that you've demonstrated? What is sealed that I am for, that I know, that I have, uh, have it just bound in my spirit? And what are those things that I'm against, that are misperceived, that are misperceptions, that are lack of understanding, lack of clarity? God, we want this filtering system through us. Because you've laid it out before, you've laid it out. You've said we can have it all. That all authority and power has been given to us. That we can heal the sick and we can raise the dead and we can cast out demons and we can cleanse the leopards and we can preach the gospel. We can change the nations. We can change the schools. We can change the business, the economy around us because the power you've given us. So, Lord, help us to align that authority and power with your word and then release it in the spheres of influence that we operate in. And if there's anything that you just want to clear up for us this morning as we go, God, I'm just inviting you to resurrect the truth in us and evict the things that don't align with your word. Lord, I thank you that we're a people of power. And you've given us everything we need. And whether it's all packed in our car or we go out empty-handed, we will have everything that we need. Through others, through supernatural multiplication, we'll have everything that we need. So we just honor and bless you, Jesus. And you've invited us for more, and we just say, pour it out, Lord. Pour out your more on us. Pour out your fire on us. Pour out your wisdom, uh, your understanding, your discernment on us. God, pour out your counsel. Just pour it out on us. We just thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Okay, if you'd like prayer, we'd be glad to pray for you today. And uh, it's going to be an awesome week. So expect. Expect the awesomeness of God.